Hello. In this episode, you will learn about enabled publications, erroneously termed defensive publications earlier. We will talk about all sorts of things about enabled publication. We'll talk about what they can do, how you can document them, how you can use them creatively, and why this becomes one of the most powerful weapons in your IP strategy, and more importantly, why it's the cheapest thing you could ever do to get the most leverage in your intellectual property strategy. So stay tuned to listen about enabled publications and how you can use it in your business for great success. Inventions keep the world spinning. From fire in the wheel to today's high tech, inventions power change. Turn your inventions into reality. Learn how to get your ideas to market. This is Invent Anything with John Cronin. So we have a number of topics today. We wanna to talk about the history of enabled publication, and then we're gonna actually really get into what are enabled publications. It's interesting in topic three, we'll actually talk about the difference between enabled publications and regular publications. And then we'll actually show you an enabled publication and show you how to document one. And then we'll actually get into strategies associated with intellectual property and enabled publications in topic five. And then finally, believe it or not, we'll talk about the future of enabled publications, which has an enormous impact in the intellectual property world in the future, considering that uh, this leads directly into artificial intelligence, which could change the world, having computers invent and creating enabled publications. So welcome back and let's go. We almost always talk about the audience and what audience would appreciate to be learning about enabled publications. I think this is gonna be a quick refresher for course for those that do know about enabled publications, but also for those who are looking for an inexpensive way to really improve their intellectual property portfolio, this is really for you. And for those guys, and gals that are out there which may consider themselves somewhat expert in an intellectual property strategy, this is for you because this will up your game to learn a lot about en enabled publications. And whether you're an early stage company or a full Fortune 500 company, uh, you'll learn a lot here in terms of how to use enabled publications and what they are. It's an inexpensive strategy, and if you have a large competitor, this episode is for you. And for those in management or supervisory levels who want to understand enabled publications, this is a great briefer. Previous episodes, we talked about enablement, and that's a fundamental underpinning to this episode. We won't recover enablement, uh, but enabled publications have to be enabled. So let's talk about the history of enabled publications. First of all, prior art has always been the rule in patentability, because if an examiner can find prior art, they can actually stop you from getting a patent. So the idea here is to use enabled publications to create prior art for the examiner. The patent offices encouraged sending in prior art, and IBM, when I was there, was had a journal called the Technical Disclosure Bulletin. It turns out it was the number one cited reference at the patent office. And that's because IBM would file 600 to 1,000 enabled publications a month. They'd be very well written. It was a searchable database, and it was easy for examiners to search it. So anything that had to do with computers, the IBM Technical Disclosure Bulletins was the first reference they wanted to look at. You see, examiners need to look at at least three patent offices and one outside reference. And they're just people just like you, so they're gonna get on and try to search. Imagine trying to search Google and trying to get through all the information about uh, enabled inventions that you can kind of use as a reference. Or imagine just going to one reference that's easily searchable where you actually know in this database there's enabled publications. When I was at IBM, I filed over 600 inventions and had hundreds of uh, enabled publications. Uh, also, keep in mind that enabled publications are gonna be uh, real inventions here. They're patentable inventions, but the, the, it doesn't warrant spending the money on patents. You publish it so nobody else can get the patent. Few companies actually understand enabled publications uh, and therefore uh, you, they can't use IBM's technical disclosure bulletin to, to file and they can't afford to have their own journal so they kind of get stuck. And so what I recognized when I left IBM was that there was an opportunity to create a company, which I did called IP.com, where anybody could come to that company and file publications that the examiner would look at. And so that, that's what happened for my particular history. One other thing about the history of enabled publications is that most people would call them defensive publications. And that's absolutely right, except, but there are many offensive strategies for publications, which is why I term them enabled publication. So at least we're talking to the, the right guy here, me, who basically has not only understood enabled publications strategically, but has written many, many, many of them up. 
uh, so I can give you that background as well. Let's move on to the second topic. What are enabled publications? As I mentioned, enabled publications, I've given that term because prior to this, we call called defensive publications, but I became aware that there were many strategies uh, that you could use for offensive. Uh, so we'll be talking about those. So I want to use the term enabled publications. And again, enabled publications are designed so patent examiners can find them quickly and use them as a reference. It turns out that enabled publications, in order to be considered as prior art, number one, have to be enabled. They have to be operative. They must be available to search. And the date has to be referenceable. And the disclosure must describe an invention in enough detail so the examiner knows that these things work. And that's the enablement episode we did earlier. What does it mean by having the date referenceable? It means that you just can't produce a publication without knowing what date it was created on because in the patent system, it's all about who, who, you know, what date and what is prior art. Uh, so enabled publications, at least in IP.com, are date stamped. So enabled publications need to be date stamped. Uh, most importantly, um, your, the, the business case to expand a portfolio is always about money. You might want to get more and more patents, but let's say that you have an incremental invention that is patentable uh, and you don't want the competitor to have it. So what you do is you publish it uh, and you can actually publish it anonymously. So that becomes prior art. Your competitor can't get the patent uh, and, and your invention is at least practicable by you. Now, if you have the patent on the core invention and then you publish the improvements, this is a wonderful strategy in order to get enabled publications to work for you. I mentioned that enabled publications need to be searchable. Uh, uh, and the patent examiner loves the fact that they can go to IP.com and be in one database and search lots of references. I also mentioned that they need to be enabled, and we covered that off in the enablement publication uh, and, and how to enable things. There's no need to have inventorship like a patent. You so, sign an oath of declaration. Uh, enablement doesn't need to have an inventor. doesn't have a, it need a company name. It can actually be anonymous, which is a great strategy. And publications, to file a publication is several hundred dollars versus the thousands and thousands of, dollars of patents. And to write them up it does take some time. And we'll show you an example today. Uh, but it doesn't take that much time to enable a publication of three or four pages. I think of it as the third leg of the stool. That is, patents, one leg. Trade secrets we've talked about in the last episode, second leg. And enable publication is the third leg. Using these three legs of the intellectual property a way of covering invention, you'll have enormous coverage to make your intellectual property be, and its portfolio be much more valuable. I know that there's a lot of experts out there that cover IP strategy and patent counsel as well are IP strategists, but enable publications doesn't seem to come up that much. So to differentiate yourself and to up your game in IP strategy, I would suggest that this episode on enable publications is for you. One other thing about enable publications and the history of it, it's not the practice of law. A patent attorney practices law, writing up patents for you and dealing with the patent office. Enabled publications can be written up by anybody, uh, whether they're aware or not. So that's good news. So coming up, we're gonna show you an actual enabled publication and show you how to write it up step by step. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. Let's move on to topic number three. How are enabled publications different from regular publications? Well, enabled publications really need to teach how. And again, you see the episode on enablement we talked about. Most publications talk about what? I mean, think about it. Marketing publications don't teach how things work. Scientific journals have lots of data on it and lots of experiments, but they don't talk about how things work. Uh, so in most ways, uh, teaching how is not in publications. Also, in most publications, they don't spell out the invention. Uh, an enabled publication needs to show the novelty and needs to enable the novelty. Marketing publications never do this. So enabled publications are more difficult to search because you're actually searching for examiners, which uh, uh, examiners need to find that novelty quickly. We talked about enabled publications can be anonymous. Regular publications are never anonymous. Everybody always puts their names on it. So it's almost difficult to hide stuff when you're putting your name on it or your company's name on it. 
Why do we want to hide anything? We want to hide things because there may be dozens of enabled publications, and if someone knew it was coming from your own company and your work, they could stitch it together pretty easily. So you're kind of hiding uh, your invention, if you will, in the public domain. Enabled publications are not scientific discoveries either, nor are they science articles with data. Uh, but rather they show the novelty and speculate and show how things work. Enabled publications really have, really have data. And enabled publications uh, focus specifically on novelty just like a patent would be. So we'll actually talk about next uh, developing and documenting an enabled publication. So on topic number four, documenting enabled publications, first of all, I mentioned there is no requirement of authorship. Um, there is a sort of best practice process to follow, uh, which I'll outline. It's something that IBM developed over 40 years uh, through their thousands and thousands of enabled publications that I got trained on. Uh, and today I'm actually trained many, many of my clients uh, and inventors how to do this. And so what I did in order to do this is I chose an example from my library and just made a copy and we'll actually review it right here. It's a piece of publication in the open art in 1991. Notice in section number one, it has authors, but I did mention before that authors are not required. Also in section number two, you see the company name. Again, that can be anonymous. Number three is a title, and notice that the title describes the key novelty of the invention. So think about always having a title where you can catch the eye of the examiner with a key novelty. One of the most important things in this example of an enabled publication is in section number four, you can see very clearly the figures uh, and they're very detailed and labeled. So as you're developing your enabled publication, you almost start with the figures first and really make sure that these figures are detailed enough so that anybody that's sort of skilled in the art would automatically know what you're doing. The, you know, they say that one figure or one picture is worth a thousand words. So the more figures you have in your, in your enabled publications, the better. Notice number five, the novelty sections, clearly and simply point out the novelty. As I mentioned before, this is really important for the examiner. Then there's, in number six, a abstract of the invention, and that kind of gives the examiner a very quick way to understand what the invention's about. And then from 7a, b, and c, uh, you can see that we have descriptions of the figures. And what you're doing there is you're simply taking everything that's in the figure and describing it. And if you read this example clearly, you'll actually see that not only are we defining each element of the figure, but we're actually combining it together to talk about how these elements work collectively. Finally, if you look at 7b and c, you see that we gave two different examples, two different methods. And that's very interesting because you can expand the novelty by giving two different examples to have a generic example be derived by the examiner. So having multiple figures with multiple elements and multiple methods is always a great way. Now, this is a, a, a quick, I know, sort of summary of what's an enabled publication, but I thought it would breathe some life in it for you. It's interesting that there are many opinions about what is and what isn't an enabled publication, but I can tell you that these minimum elements will work every time. So stay tuned, and in our last set of topics, we're going to learn the many strategies of enabled publication, and maybe, just maybe, one of these strategies, even though we're not listing them all, but maybe one of these strategies could actually change your company. Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. On topic number five, we're going to talk about enable publications and IP strategies. Now, I love to talk about strategy, and uh, I hope I don't overdo it here, but I'm going to give you some specific strategies that will definitely help you with enable publications. We have de developed dozens and dozens of strategies on enable publications, I think maybe even a hundred. We don't have time to go through them all, but I think some of these strategies will be a nice guide for you so that you actually can get an idea of the capability of how you could use enable publications. The main enable publication strategy is literally to place the technology in the public domain so that everyone else can see it, particularly the examiner. So the examiner won't allow somebody else's patents. But once the invention is in the public domain, it's no longer patentable. So keep in mind that once you publish an invention, you can no longer patent it. However, you do have in a year the ability to file in the U.S., but in the rest of the world, the patent is gone. Enable publications also enhance your freedom to operate. What does that mean? Well, 
since we talked about a patent in earlier episodes, has the ability to stop you from make using and selling. If you put a publication in the public domain, what happens is no one else can get a patent on that. But if you need to use that enabled publication, that invention in your process, it gives you freedom to operate, meaning that nobody else can get a patent on it. One of the things we did talk about is this thing about the new and non-obvious requirements of a patent. And it's very similar because in enabled publications, keep in mind, you're actually publishing what is patentable. You're just making sure that nobody else is going to get the patent on it. It makes no sense to use enabled publications to publish something that you don't think is patentable. There's publishing within a patent, which is what some patent attorneys do, meaning they just add extra subject matter to the patent, publishing the stuff they're not claiming. And that's a positive. But you can also publish within a patent as well, and there are negatives to doing that. The negatives are that you're teaching an awful lot in one patent, and people know that it's you, your company, and the author. So you may be teaching them more than you can afford to claim, and that's not good. So one of the things you'd like to do is to determine whether you want to publish in a patent or not. Many times it's impossible to publish in a patent because you write the patent up and get it in the system, and then later on you find these other improvements. So it's almost impossible to publish within a patent uh, and to do it well. So publishing as an enabled publication is really the way to do it. One of the things about these publications is that it discourages competitors from getting patents. Uh, you can see in many infringement trials of patents that someone finds prior art that was out prior to your invention and they actually use the prior art to help you not to help them knock out the patent. Enable publications can be, be used offensively. And here we go in terms of the offensive strategies. Consider that you have a well with wonderful water. Consider that you have other people around you that also have wells and you're selling water in the wells. Imagine if you poisoned everybody else's water and that your, yours was the only well that wasn't poisoned. In essence, enable publications is poisoning the prior art. It's stopping everybody else from inventing because you're publishing. So think about it as building around your own patent so that nobody else can invent on top of you or around you makes your own patent even stronger. And that's an offensive publication. Although enabled publications can be used defensively, we mentioned there are many examples uh, where you can use enabled publications. Here's a thought. Supposing you have a competitor and supposing you're in one market, market A. Supposing your competitor is in two markets, market A and market B. And supposing your competitor in market A and market B, they're making money. They're making a lot of money in market B and they're using those profits to put into market A to compete with you. Imagine if you could run some brainstorming sessions with your team and come up with inventions in market B. And then imagine that you start publishing anonymously all sorts of inventions in market B. Over time, what's gonna happen is the competitor will not be able to patent in market B, and therefore they'll start to lose their own composite competition in market B. In essence, by minimizing one of the markets of your competitor where they can't make money, you're maximizing your defense against the competitor. And that's a wonderful offensive strategy. I'll, I'll, I'll label a couple of others here. Let's talk about stop picket fencing. One of the things in patents is that many companies competitively try to picket fence around your patent giving you less room for you to expand your inventions. Enable publications will stop picket fencing. Another one we call is king of the hill. You publish inventions to make your patents have greater value, as I just mentioned. There are many times where you'd like to control or, or, or at least make sure your suppliers or your customers don't get patents in your domain. Many times you have an invention and then your customer will patent how to use it and you don't want to be patenting in your customer's domain because they might not want to buy from you. So by publishing anonymously, your customer can't get patents. Same with your supplier. It's a great way of doing it. One of the things we have used enabled publications for is called fortress busting. And this means that when you have a competitor there that has a heavy patent filing, you can anonymously and cheaply publish lots of enabled publication to stop them from patenting. So you can see it's very powerful in order to use enabled publications in all sorts of ways. And I'm sorry I don't have the time to go through all the various strategies. When we do IP strategy work, you know, we're always learning about what the client wants and we'll try to string together the right strategies for publications and then recognize that we can weave together some of the strategies we talked about for patenting and some of the strategies we talked about for trade secrets along with these strategies for publication, interweaving them to have a, a wonderful uh, strategy 
that can deal against any competitor. Well, let's go to topic number six, the future of enabled publication. This will probably surprise you. I mean, prior art has always been prior art. Enabled publications are there to stop others from getting patents, especially you'll file publications when the business case is not there for you to file your patents. And I sort of thinking about this, it reminded me of a Dr. Taylor uh, who basically created two inventions with the machine, an AI machine. And the machine actually invented uh, uh, inventions. And he decided to file two of those inventions as patents. And Dr. Taylor actually got involved with the UK and US Patent Office to debate the idea that uh, AI machines could invent. Imagine that, in intelligent machines starting to come up with creative solutions to problems and filing patents. But what happened here is it turns out that in the discussion with Dr. Taylor in the patent office, it's called the Dabas case, that the patent office basically stated that the rules and regulations of the patent offices is that a human is required to invent. So just because the previous rule said human, they did not allow his inventions to be considered. Well, think about this. There is no rules and regulations about the inventorship of a publication. So now I'm gonna set Dr. Taylor's inventions and they're gonna actually be created and published because there's, there's no determination of a human or not. So now if you had an AI computer that you could just simply program and then hit the button and it produces hundreds and hundreds of enabled publications, pretty scary, isn't it? One of the things about enabled publications is that all those that like open source always talk about how patent system is minimizing or impacting open source. Well, clearly using enabled publications for open source is the way to go because now you can use the law to your advantage by publishing invention so that nobody else get a patent on it. One of the other things is that uh, you can invent all sorts of things and publish it uh, and you can do it in any market you want. Uh, and so that gives you the ability to publish in some markets and not in others, giving you all sorts of interesting strategies. This AI capability could be programmed to essentially do something that could really impact the future of patents. If you start already having AI machines to publish a lot uh, so that you're stopping lots of patents, the patent system could eventually be threatened by having computers just publishing millions of documents a day uh, and having multiple companies doing that really creating so much prior art that it'd be impossible to get patents. So that's something to think about because our future tied to this AI is scary enough to think about AI inventing and then think about AI inventing and then publishing. And by the way, in the future, the laws you know, of the patent system protects economies. And if you impact the patent systems, you could impact, impact the economies. So tying AI to enable publications could impact huge economies. So this is a very important subject. Well, let's wrap up. I talked about the history of enabled publication. I talked about my per personal history as an inventor of enabled publications. I talked about IBM, the Technical Disclosure Bulletin, and talked about IP.com, which is the company I started that now you can enjoy. Uh, I have no ownership in IP.com anymore, but now you can enjoy using IP.com. And there are other venues as well to publish enabled publications. We then talked about what is enabled publication. We said that clearly early on that we used as defensive publications, but if you start to consider offensive strategies, you recognize defensive or offensive, the new moniker is enabled publications, and that's what we use. Most importantly, we discuss that these enabled publications are the third leg of the stool, trade secrets, patents, and enabled publications as the three legs of the IP protection for invention. We actually talked about how enabled publications are different than regular publications. We discussed that regular publications teach the what, used for marketing, used for science journals, etc. But most regular publications do not enable. On the other hand, uh, also most publications don't show what's novel. Uh, for enabled publications to be done well, you need to show what's novel and you need to enable that uh, novelty. And so that's why they're different. We went through a very simple example of, of one case enabled publications of, that was in my library. And we talked about the five or six clear areas that you need. And most importantly is to describe the novelty, to back that novelty up with figures that have detailed definitions in the figures, and then to back that definition of figures up with good solid written um, specification to show how all those elements work and how they work together. In topic number five, we talked about different enabled publication strategies. Everything from how you discourage competitors, strategies like King of the Hill, 
how you can work with your supplier or customers to make sure that they don't get patents, etc. So hopefully that will start you on your journey using Enable Publications for strategy. And lastly, we talked about the future of Enable Publications and what it could do. The ability for Enable Publications to join to the hip with AI, since there's no requirement for AI uh, uh, or Enable Publications from, from inventorship, it won't get hemmed in by AI and AI can literally start inventing. So as our machines get more intelligent and they can invent more, they can publish more to create more prior art to stop more patents. And that has really big implications for the patent system down the road and also implications further in terms of economy. So we're talking about a very important piece of subject matter here. Remember uh, for Enable Publications uh, that it's, it is an invention that would be patentable except the business case is not there to file the patent and you don't want anybody else from getting the patent, so you publish it. So thanks again, and please subscribe to our Invent Anything uh, episodes and our Invent Anything blog, and we'll see you again.